Guys, I'm going to show you one of Bobby Fischer's best end games. This was against Michael Tall, who was another world champion, and Bobby was only 19 years old when he played this game, and it blew my mind. Tall was 26. So in this end game, Fischer's position is actually a little bit worse because of his bad pawn structure, but he finds a way to turn around and almost plays with godly perfection. So in this situation, he first plays rook d1, the first important decision, sacrificing this pawn. So Tal takes the pawn. Fisher must have an idea, right? So his rook's pinned, so he takes the rook, and Tal takes. And now we see the point. He pins the knight. Of course, Tal saw this, and he unpins with rook c7. So did white just lose a pawn for nothing? No. Again, Fisher's secret, I think, is that he sees all of the possibilities, almost like a computer in the position, all of the reasonable possibilities and transformations, and he evaluates the best one, not just the best one in terms of if it's equal or not, also the best one in terms of which keeps the most tension on the board and gives him the most winning chances. So he sacrifices a pawn here, to improve his bishop, bishop f4. Using small tactics, he improves his position. So his amazing calculation skills, seeing all the possibilities, and amazing evaluation skills is what makes him a terrifying endgame player. So Tal plays rook c6 here, and Fisher sacrifices the other pawn with bishop e5, an excellent move. So he sacrifices one pawn just to improve his bishop, and he evaluates correctly. Tal didn't dare take the second pawn here. If he did, he would actually lose with no hope. After knight a2, now white will trade rooks, and then instead of taking this pawn, we go for the f5 pawn. So look at me race. Takes here, and now we don't want to waste time by taking this pawn. g4 is the best move. And after something like takes, we can go here. Actually, we go here. And now we can sacrifice the bishop later on. And this is one of the reasons why bishop is better than a knight when there are pawns on both sides, which Fisher accurately evaluated, right? So this is an easy win. So bishops are stronger than knights when there are pawns on multiple sides, even if it means sacrificing a pawn sometimes. So anyway, going back to this position, Tal didn't dare take the pawn. He instead played knight d5, a reasonable move, offering a rook trade. Now, would we take the rook and then win back the pawn? No, Fisher again, correctly evaluated that. That might be an equal position, but there's no hope for victory. He maintains the tension with an even better move, rook d1. Engine-like play, almost. And Tal plays knight f6, and he's up a pawn, right? But Fisher has seen further, he's calculating like a machine. He saw that he can continue the attack with king f4 attacking the pawn. Tal plays g6. And now, Fisher plays a prophylactic move, f3, to kill the knight's chances forward. And then, he sees the idea, king g5, to take the pawn, just like that. So Tal plays knight d7, attacking the bishop. Fisher needs to keep the bishop to maintain the tension on the board and winning chances, so he finds the best spot. Literally, the best spot is bishop d6, an excellent move. Now the pawn is... Very, very vulnerable, and the bishop dominates both the rook and the knight. Incredibly so. The knight can't go here. Tal realizes that if he doesn't act right now, he might lose really quickly, so he goes for aggressive defense, although this was actually a mistake. Rook c2, Fisher calmly plays g3 and offers this pawn. If you take the pawn, actually, in this position, once again, the bishop can sacrifice itself for the pawn anytime it comes over, and Fisher has more winning chances. So Tal decides to regroup the rook and go rook e2 after g3 and king g5, rook e6. However, he's in a more passive defensive situation now. He thought maybe he was safe, right? It's protected. Now maybe he can start pushing his pawns and making progress. But again, Fisher's secret, I think, he says he just sees every single possibility that there is and then chooses the best one that gives him the most chances. So here, he found an unbelievable way to break the fortress. Can you see it? 
is to switch the bishop and the rook's places. Bishop f4. An unbelievable move. We're just going to switch the rook. And now after the trade, we can take this pawn and the bishop comes back with tempo, right? So the knight still can't go there. And the thing is, black can't really stop this move. Rook d6. He can't stop it. Top plays knight f8, readying the defense. But Fisher still plays rook d6. Now I'm trying to maybe take and then take the pawn. But Tal plays this, inviting Fisher to take. There's a big calculation. If I take, take, take the pawn, there's going to be a pawn race. And Fisher accurately calculates that this is not a race that we want to participate in. Because there's a funny line here. Where's the race? And it looks like white might win their race because of the check. So, But instead of taking this pawn, black will play a3. And then white actually loses. So Fisher probably saw all that and did not go into this variation. So instead of taking the rook, he first played king h6, breaching the defense like this with the king. Now, king g7 is going to be a big threat. So Tal regroups again. He plays rook e2, attacking the pawn. I think he wants to go king g7, knight e6 check. That's the idea. So Fisher played Incredible move, rook d2, pivoting. The idea of this move is that we offer a trade of rooks, and then the king will still come in and break the fortress. So what if uh, Tal played something else, like rook e1? Well, now we can go bishop d6. Using tempo, it's almost magical how the rook and bishop switch once, and now they can switch again, right? So after rook d2, Tal decides to do another defense. He played rook e7 instead, because rook e6 would king g7, right? So rook e7, trying to defend this way. But every time Tal reconstructs the defense that Fisher just broke down, it gets inferior. The, the armor is cracking. So Fisher plays bishop d6, skewering, and Tal plays rook f7. Rook h7 check first, and then rook f7. Nice. He's constructing a defense as best as he could. And Fisher can break the defense, but he has to do it carefully because if you take the, the knight now, this is not a good idea because that's a very drawish endgame. And Fisher keeps the tension as much as possible. Here he plays an incredible move. Rook b2. And black is actually pretty much in Zugzwang. The knight can't move. The rook can't move because of the knight. The king can't move because of the pawn. Only this pawn can move, but then I collect it. So Tal somehow is completely tied down. And he realizes this. So Tal plays pawn sacrifice f4. So finally he broke down the defense. And now bishop takes f4, rook f5 check. Tal's trying to fight back. King here b5. So maybe disrupted the forces a little bit. There's a pin on this uh, bishop here. So... It seems like Tal's a little bit less passive now, right? His king can come out, his pawns can run. But once again, Fisher sees all of the possibilities and somehow finds the best one with the most practical chances and tension. He plays bishop d6, transforming the position once again, sacrificing this pawn. But the idea is now we win these pawns and potentially these pawns too. And practically, this is probably winning. So Tal realizes this and plays b4. But since the bishop moved, now these pawns are more free. And once again, not f4, Fisher plays g4, sacrificing the pawn that he won back, and then g5. Unbelievable. How does he see all these possibilities, right? Now the point is, this pawn is his golden goose. We can go king g7 or bishop f8 now, actually, and then take both the pawns and win the game. So Tal sees this. He plays knight e6. And then Fisher finally wins the pawn. Tal goes rook d6. So now it's a conversion phase. Fisher is, it's equal pawns, but he's really got this pass pawn. Rook e3, king f5, attacking the knight. And now nice move, rook g2, rook behind the pass pawn. Tal is almost lost. He plays rook check. Bishop blocks, king d7, threatening this way to win the bishop. But Fisher calculates correctly. 
He sacrifices the bishop because the pawn is going to be a queen. King e5. And the pawn is going to be a queen. Tal tries to hold on with rook f8. But Fisher has won an exchange. If Tal manages to trade off these pawns, it's a draw. But Fisher doesn't let go. It's so precise. Rook g7. First king d5. Opposition. And then rook g7 check. Pushing the king to the edge. And now, not going after the pawns directly because maybe black can try to trade off the pawns. King d6, dominating the knight. Once again, black is in Zugzwang. Tao plays b3, and Fisher doesn't trade. Instead, he plays the elegant a3. And Tal resigned because he has no moves. If he goes b2, Fisher will check first and then do a fork, and he'll win both the pawns. And if he plays king d8 first, in this position, Fisher will go rook a7 with a double threat. And now after king moves somewhere, takes and here. I hope you really enjoyed this breakdown on the secret, the precision of Bobby Fisher. And, and he did this in 1960s when there was no computer. So he was years ahead of everybody else. So I hope this inspired you, and I'll see you in the next video.